one term that comes to mind when I think about everything that has been taken into consideration, even from months prior up until this point. And that one word, as we have gone through the imagery and as we have gone through the context, as we have gone through the language, seeing the ecclesiastical cycle and how it repeats every single generation without fail, without fault, seeing its start, seeing its center, seeing its completion. There's only one word that I could think of that the author of the book of Genesis is wanting to inspire their reader to meditate on. And that one word that I cannot seem to get away from, especially since the previous episode is tidings, good tidings. And when we hear that phrase, good tidings, we often associate that with another word called gospel. The good tidings, as looking at what the author of the book of Genesis is, is really getting at, is warning their reader about, is even pleading for their reader to realize how things work within the religious world, what the conversation is supposed to acknowledge, what the conversation is supposed to disengage from, and what the conversation is supposed to harp on personally for its own growth and development. The only thing that I can see, the only thing that the author of the book of Genesis writing those chapters and putting together those uh, illustrations, what they are getting at, they are actually getting at what we would call today gospel truth. What is gospel truth according to Bible? If you could sum up what everything that we have seen in the Bible is, because everything that we are reviewing, that's what the actual tidings are. I don't know about the whatever we want to Imagine gospel is, according to our traditional or opinionated Christian stance or non-Christian opinionated or denominated stance, but I like to attack things from Bible. And Bible has a mind of its own and Bible has its own philosophy and Bible has its own tidings that are to be acknowledged. Every episode that we have been prior Every episode prior that we have been digging into this subject, it is touching on what Bible tidings are. And I want to share a, a passage here. And this passage is coming from the Nagamadi scriptures. Coming from the Nagamadi scriptures, and it is entitled The Gospel of Truth. Now, everything that we have been reviewing thus far it is summed up in, in this passage that I'm going to quote and in a, you know, in a fairly unique way that gets, gets the gist of the cross. This is the word of the gospel about the discovery of fullness for those who await salvation coming from above. Their hope for which they are waiting is in waiting. And this is their image, the light in which there is no shadow. At this time, the fullness is about to come. The efficiency of matter is not from the infinity of the Father, who came to give time to deficiency. In fact, it is not right to say that the incorruptible would actually come in this manner. The Father's depth is profound, and the thought of error is not with him. It is something that has fallen and something that can readily be set upright through the discovery of the one who has come to what he would restore. This restoration is called repentance. The reason that the incorruptible breathed out and followed after the one who sinned was so that the sinner might find rest. Forgiveness is what remains for the light in deficiency, the word of fullness. For a doctor rushes to where there is sickness, and since that is the doctor's wish, the person in need does not hide it because the doctor has what the patient needs. Thus fullness which has no deficiency, 
but fills up deficiency is provided to fill a person's need so that the person may receive grace. While deficient, the person had no grace, and because of this, a diminishing took place where there was no grace. When the diminished part was restored, the person in need was revealed as fullness. This is what it means to discover the light of truth that has shone toward a person. It is unchangeable. And I'm bringing this out, this point made in this verse, because everything here thus said, again, as creative as it is and as colorful as it sounds, it is everything that we have been reviewing from the author of the book of Genesis. When you think about what the author of the book of Genesis is calling salvation, what the author of the book of Genesis is calling redemption, the author of the book of Genesis is letting their reader know that whether it is termed salvation, whether it is termed redemption, or whether it is termed more favorably justification, it all revolves around this idea of repentance and forgiveness. And we're not talking about forgiveness or repentance to someone else. We're not even talking about forgiveness and repentance toward our human self. We are initially talking about, and I understand the context of where the Nagamati scriptures, where this author is going, this is not where the Bible is going, but this, the, the context of what they're saying fits into that scheme. The immediate forgiveness, the immediate repentance is for the self of the devotional conversation, which is actually what this author is talking about here. Taking the conversation to the height that it needs to be at. And in order for that to take place, one must understand the concept of repentance and being penitent towards the self of the devotional conversation's character. So then the question arises, what is one to be repentant towards? What is the devotional character um, why is forgiveness needed? Well, according to the author of the book of Genesis, they're giving us the wrong way. They're giving us the wrong way to manage our conversation. The way in which leads to subjection under imaginary images and a Lord or a Baal per generation, unchanging. This is the matrix. Author of the book of Genesis is letting us know what the matrix is. How do you escape it? We should understand the lesson of not doing what we are observing. And because each and every single one of our conversations is conceived within the religious world, it then you know, becomes us to observe what our conversation is to be sorry for it. Why? Because this is not the intended conversation according to the narrative in Genesis. This is not the intended conversation that was or should be intended. What is to be redeemed from, what is to be saved, what is to be justified is the self of the conversation from the illustration that is given in the book of Genesis. That's why the illustration is so brilliant. And that's why reviewing the content Thus far I discussed the only word I could think of to positively attribute the goodness, or should I say as a term that we should be familiar with as well, studying it, the loving kindness of the living God is tidings. These are good tidings. The author of the book of Genesis is introducing their reader to the good tidings which good tidings carry not just in that book or chapter, but carry throughout every book and chapter of the Bible in its own way, all reverberating back down to this illustration in Genesis 2 and 3, one included. And I find it interesting that while there may be conception of what redemption or salvation is in the present traditional religious landscape, and in the present opinionated traditional religious landscape, what's left out of the cut, what's not known, is what the Bible is actually saying. What the writers therein are articulating from a 
point that is appearing colorful, imaginative, creative, yet underneath it all is concrete philosophy. Concrete philosophy related to tidings concerning the individual conversation, learning how to repent or to be sorry or to move forward from its natural deviant self. Now, everything that I'm saying, traditional religion and even opinionated religion likes to place onto the human being. It is the human being that needs to be sorry because there is no God in existence that can accept the human being the way that it is. That's why religions from time prior until now have invented their bales and their Marys as intercessors. Same story per generation. Again, author of the book of Genesis tells us this. This is not the aim of what the Bible's mind is after, especially the author of the book of Genesis, who is advising their reader, let their conversation be penitent toward the experience, toward the intended experience to understand where it ought to be. Knowing Bible is a course for learners wanting to grow closer to themselves and to their creator. There is a reason why we trust the Bible. There is a reason why the Bible moves us to celebrate it. There is also a reason why we feel hesitant to let the Bible's words satisfy us. Traditional religious theory isn't always satisfactory. Carrying a belief without proof will soon aggravate our thoughts and feelings. Knowing Bible is a course that is designed to wake us up to who and what our belief is. Knowing Bible is for learners that want a living experience beyond conventional religion. Don't let this educational opportunity slip away from you. Now looking in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 40 and verse 9, to these tidings, Isaiah 40 and verse 9. Isaiah 40 and verse 9 reads, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring, bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Now all of these terms, voice, strength, God, we have all, we, we've gone through these in prior episodes, so what we are actually reading here is not a declaration of an individual wanting to magnify deity in term. What we have here is an individual magnifying a specific concept. There's a specific concept, and especially as you move into Isaiah 41 and then 42, go on to 51, 58, there is a concept that is consistent throughout especially when you get to Isaiah 51 and verse 4, there is a specific concept highlighted by a specific law that is supposed to be a specific judgment acting upon the inward parts. These tidings acting upon the inward parts. Sorry, I should say this law, this judgment acting upon the inward parts. The, this is that tiding. These are those tidings. How beautiful upon the mountains and the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, it says, that publisheth peace. All throughout that we have been, what we have been studying from the book of Genesis, we have been seeing the author carving out the foundational principle of what those tidings are. We don't have to look any further. It has always been behold. And what to behold is the author of the book Book of Isaiah, make that very plain. Again, Isaiah 51 and verse 4, A law shall proceed from me, a light shall rest for a judgment unto the people. The author of the book of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, they are actually giving us that law that Isaiah 51 and verse 4 is stating. This is that law of justification. The author of the book of Genesis is, is, is letting us know what that law is through illustration. That illustration is supposed to fall back down to allow the reader, the careful observer, to understand what that outcome is supposed to lead to, which is a conversation away, moving away from what that illustration is magnifying. That illustration is magnifying the consequence 
of deviating from a from an experience with the philosophy of a quote unquote life, which is maintaining an experience with wisdom coming from out of the scriptures. Maintaining a relationship with those words that is hedged up. That's the consequence for deviating from them with imaginary images and a veil. Author of the book of Genesis is giving us so much. They're giving their reader so much and letting their reader into the cycle of things so that they can then make a decision for their devotional character. Making a decision, making that decision for the devotional character is a witness, is a sign, as it says in to, to, the, to the Corinthians, of zeal for no longer wanting to commit that wrong. The change in behavior, the change in deportment, the change in desire, the zeal to no longer go back, being penitent for maintaining a, a devotional lifestyle that is not advocated at all by the mind within the scriptures. And one, that the devotional conversation knows that it itself should not be maintaining because it never felt right, never, never was right, it never... Once something dawned within, it, it could never go back, it could only move forward, and moving forward is all that the Bible calls for. Moving forward and acknowledging what those tidings, what that good news, what that gospel is, and the good news, those tidings, that gospel from each and every single book of the Bible, beginning in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, is justification, is justification, from religious law, justification from religious law, justification from imaginary images joined to a bail, justification from religious law, plus imaginary images joined to a bail for an experience with quote unquote that way of life. Now Isaiah 52 7 highlights that the tidings that are to be published are those of peace. As I previously stated, Isaiah 52 in verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now what is peace? What is this peace that is to be brought? What is this peace that is to be published? Are we talking about peace as in no war are we talking about peace as in pacifism or what's go, what, what what is this psalm 119 162 to 165 psalm 119 162 to 165 i rejoice that thy word is one that findeth great spoil i hate and abhor lying but thy law do i love seven times a day do i praise thee because of thy righteous judgments great Peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Highlighting this verse here, because the one that is publishing is publishing peace, which also in the same verse is salvation. Peace, salvation, authors make in a connotation, they mean the same thing. The peace here in reference is law. Read that again. Great peace have they which love thy law. When we're hearing this, they're publishing peace. They're actually publishing a specific law, not law as in Moses, law as in standard, law as in philosophy. They're publishing a specific standard, a standard that the authors of the Bible call peace. Second Peter 1 in verse 2, what, what law is it that brings peace? Second Peter 1 in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through what? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So now we can understand what this law is, what this peace is that is published, because peace doesn't just, it's not just a solitary term to the Bible's mind. Peace is actually a knowledge. Peace is actually a knowledge. When we're hearing that, great peace have they which love thy law, uh, grace and peace multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. This, whatever this law is, that is peace, it is a knowledge. 
It is a knowledge. This law is a knowledge. Jumping down to Romans 5, or should I say flipping to Romans 5, does the religious law bring peace? Does the religious law bring peace? Because it's easy to confuse and think that the Bible is saying, great peace have those which love thy law, and that law we can always traditionally connect back to Moses or whatever denominational upbringing we have. That is our law. That is the peace we, we, we want to believe, but does the religious law bring peace? Romans 5 and verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The religious law did not bring peace, according to the author writing this verse. The religious law does not bring peace. The religious law does not bring comfort, despite whatever order we may feel comes from that. The religious law brings awareness, and awareness does not bring peace. Awareness does not bring uh, settling. Awareness brings uneasiness. Awareness brings an unsettling, sorry. Religious law brings uneasiness. Religious law is supposed to bring unsettling, not peace. Romans 7, 7 to 9. Romans 7, 7 to 9. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Just another illustration here, just to show that when religious law is in play, it is not about peace. Religious law is in play because it needs you to understand how small, quote unquote, God thinks of you and you should think of yourself. Therefore, you need to do something in order to not feel that way anymore and for, quote unquote, God not to feel that way anymore toward you. That's what the religious law does. There is there's, there's no peace in that. It may be to some, but in reality... That's very harmful to the psyche of both the personal and the devotional conscience. Journey into a marriage of self-discovery with growth. Immerse yourself in eloquent verses that tenderly explore the bond between heart and mind, unveiling the art of self-love. Embark on a poetic odyssey between the heart's yearnings and the mind's reflections as they come together to highlight self-acceptance. Growth is a collection that gracefully unfolds the intricate chapters of one's own narrative. Each poem a testament to the intertwining journey of love, vulnerability, and cooperation. As you turn each page, you'll witness the blossoming of self-compassion, a gradual revelation as you navigate the labyrinth of emotions and thoughts. Discover the power and the beauty that arises from valuing your worth. Growth invites you to nurture your heart and mind, cultivating a garden of self-love. Observe and embrace the journey. Explore, evolve, and find solace in the verses that resonate with your very soul. Looking at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 1 and 2, just continuing this stream of thought with this one verse that will uh, pretty much seal, seal, seal this up. Hebrews 10, 1 and 2, for the law having a shot of the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the thing can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience for sins um, again religious law does not bring peace it only brings awareness of what is not right in you and awareness of what God thinks is not right in you and so it forces you to think about what to do in order to be well. And that's how you can just go into a, a, a place that is contrary, as the illustration in Genesis shows, uh, to the intended experience. You begin to sew fig leaves or aprons on, illustrations that we have seen uh, play out. But let's turn to Psalm 29, verse 11. Psalm 29, 11 reads, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalm 29, 11 makes a connotation there between strength and peace. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Strength equals peace. 
to the Bible's mind. Strength equals peace. Isaiah 27, 4 and 5. Isaiah 27, 4 and 5. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Again, peace equals strength to the Bible's mind. What is strength? Job 8, 14. Counsel is mind and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Still in Job, Job 12, 16. There's a reason why I'm going through these verses. Job 12, 16. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. Job 35, sorry, Job 36 in verse 5. Job 36 in verse 5 reads, Behold, God is mighty, despiseth not any. He's mighty in strength and in wisdom. Strength equals wisdom. Peace equals strength. Strength equals wisdom. Peace equals wisdom. The general definition of peace in the Bible is not as we may assume, as in pacifism. And the general idea of peace that comes from the religious law is really not in reality what it is because there is no peace in there. Peace to the Bible's mind is strength. Strength to the Bible's mind is wisdom and understanding. The one publishing peace, they are actually publishing an understanding. The one that the Bible says is publishing peace and says publishing salvation, peace and salvation being the same thing. Salvation is actually an understanding. Salvation is actually an understanding and an understanding is for what is within. That's why salvation whether it is redemption or whatever you want to call it, main term here, in this case, justification, it is all to occur within. And primarily and firstly, within for the devotional conversations, thoughts and feelings, actions and behaviors. That's the Bible's primary target, the conversation. Human being is next. Because it is from the experience of that, that the human being witnesses this, and then begins to understand its route. Peace of the Bible's mind that is published. This is the illustration that we are seeing in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is giving us the understanding of justification. This understanding, the, that's the tidings. That good news, <laughs> that good news that we are seeing in the book of Genesis magnified is the good news of the intended devotional character character, the intended devotional character, the intended devotional experience. As I'm reviewing everything and as I'm seeing how, you know, Bible is, is letting things play out, Bible is actually showing gospel. It's tiding truth, which is intended devotional experience. Now, everything that the author of the book of Genesis is saying, everything that the Bible highlights as what its tidings are, yes, it has been covered up. It has been hidden by what we now believe is um, traditional organized thought, traditional organized religious thought, and even with our own personal traditional organized opinionated thought, covered up. But the Bible never changes. Neither does the Bible's philosophy. The gospel the truth of it, the fact of it, is the justification of the devotional conversation away from the concept of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what the illustration is pointing to. And the breakdown of those concepts we have already, so now we understand and can understand that the author of the book of Genesis wants the devotional conversation to take strength from the mind within the scriptures and using that strength, taking that strength, articulating it to its core in a way that guides it into the intended experience that it's supposed to be having.